Hello everybody. Just get a few more minutes just to get let people join. Okay, so I think we will kick off now. But um, yes, hello everybody and welcome to our Smarter Regulations Sandbox launch webinar. So um, could we go to the next slide, please, Ella? So I'm Helen Barnforth and I'm the Head of Data Analytics at the Health and Safety Executive. I'm the Programme Director for Discovering Safety and I'm also the Programme Lead for this new project. And I'll be joined today by my colleagues Zeynep Zalik from the Smarter Regulation Directorate, Seb Andraras from HAL Robotics, and Seb Corby from the Safety Tech Accelerator. Next slide, please. So over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to give you a bit of an overview of the Smarter Regulation Sandbox and how you can get involved. I'm going to start with a quick introduction to some of the background to the project. And then I'm going to hand over to Zeynep to provide a wider government view. And then Seb A is going to provide a view from industry. And then finally, Seb C will provide some of the details about why and how you get involved. And we're going to make sure we leave plenty of time to answer any questions that you might have at the end. So please feel free to start adding them into the chat function as we're going through this and we'll, we'll come to them at the end. Next slide, please. So this project builds on the success of our recent industrial safety tech regulatory sandbox project that we ran last year. Um, and this was funded by DSIT through the Regulator Pioneers Fund. And it focused on a number of priority health and safety risk topics and examined how technology could help improve health and safety performance and compliance in these areas. And it was a collaboration between HSC and the Safety Tech Accelerator, and we worked closely with industry colleagues from construction and tech sectors to build a collaborative space to discuss, explore, and accelerate our understanding of how new tech can help manage health and safety risks. And we undertook six very varied studies um, and explored opportunities to improve performance and compliance with tech, and also try and better understand the barriers to tech adoption that we know exist. And from this, we had a wide set of recommendations that um, we're taking forward, including running another sandbox to further explore the potential for smarter regulation. So hence this new project. Uh, next slide, please. So the smarter regulation sandbox is funded by the Government Office for Technology Transfer, and it's looking to explore how we can use smarter regulation to improve compliance and reduce the regulatory burden on industry. And with our Smarter Regulation Sandbox approach, we're aiming to provide industry with increased assurance, confidence and clarity on compliance. Tech companies with the opportunity to capture and use smarter regulatory information to create innovative solutions for industry. And regulators with a pro-innovation environment to trial smarter interventions and better understand opportunities to improve compliance. Next slide, please. So why does HC want to do this? Well, we're very much moving towards being a, a more data-driven, evidence-based enabling regulator. And as highlighted in our new strategy, we want to make sure we can maintain Great Britain as one of the healthiest and safest places to work and enable industry to innovate to do that. And we also know that the workplace is evolving rapidly and that the adoption of technology is increasing. And as a regulator, we know we have an important role to play in understanding the opportunities to improve compliance and performance using technology and also understand the new regulatory challenges. So we want to continue to collaborate with stakeholders to understand opportunities and challenges. We want to um, understand the opportunities for improving health and safety performance using technology and we want to encourage and support innovation to understand and manage risk and we also want to be proactive in understanding the regulatory implications of new technologies and the future and the workplace of the future. So our SRS environment will hopefully help provide all of these. 
So I'm now going to hand over to Zainab, who's going to tell you a bit more about how the um, SRD are getting involved in the project. Thanks, Zainab. Thank you, Helen. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Zainab. I work in the Smarter Regulation Digital Team in the Department of Business and Trade. Um, the SRD's mission itself is to make regulation smarter in order to reduce regulatory burdens and support innovation and growth. And my team in particular, we're really interested in exploring how we can build digital services for regulated entities in order to understand better what regulations apply to them. Um, and as part of this, we're building something that we call the ORP, the Open Regulation Platform, which once completed will act as a searchable register for UK regulation across the economy. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the challenge that we're looking at um, comes from a lot of business feedback that we've received in the fact that the regulatory landscape is just really complex. So we've got over 90 different regulators publishing regulations in different files and formats. If you're trying to do a basic search, it can be quite hard to find the relevant regulation, the ones that you need to comply with in order to complete either a day-to-day -day action or bring a new product or service to market. And often to find that information, you have to go across a bunch of different regulator websites, for example, and then you have to look through different document types like regulations, code of practices, standards, guidance documents, etc. So we just want to make that simpler. As well as being difficult for businesses to navigate anyways, due to the fact that most of that regulation data is published currently either in a really unstructured way or it's not structured consistently enough, that makes it harder for innovative or innovators or reg tech companies to reuse that data and information to create services and products that help support regulatory compliance again across the economy. And we believe that for the UK to have a regulatory system that is actually pro-innovation, and that supports businesses across all industries, regulatory reform needs to encourage new processes, products and business models. And the way that we think that we can help do that is by transforming how regulatory information is structured and published. And we think that will reduce the administrative burden of regulatory compliance for everyone. And it will also help improve the understanding of the regulatory landscape. So not only will business be businesses be able to navigate through regulation more effectively. But in the long run, we believe it will help government and industry to create some of those services to help support regulatory compliance and bring innovation. For example, whether they want to help guide re regulated entities or businesses towards relevant actions or help them to understand compliance, just unlocking that data set is something that we think will be able to help. Um, but creating that register of regulations that I talked about in our platform, it's just the first step. So we're also working with regulators across government to talk about how regulation is structured and published at the source so that in the long run, we will have those regulations published in a more consistent way. But we can't do it alone. And we really believe that it's vital that we talk to businesses and we work with industries to understand those compliance burdens, which is why we are really interested in this sandbox today. We want to know how can we help improve regulatory compliance and innovation through better structured content and data. Um, we think this sandbox is unbelievably important. We think innovative regulators like HSE are thinking about how they can support businesses through these sandboxes that really link together industry, regulators, and tech companies. So we can see the whole picture and we can come up with some shared solutions to removing those barriers and supporting innovation. And if we can, we don't just want to focus on health and safety or on the construction sector, but we'd really like to replicate this across the entire economy. So it's a whole of government plan to structuring data. I am going to stop right there, and I think next we are hearing Seb with his presentation. Good afternoon. Um, cool. uh, thanks, Seb. I am Seb Andros. I'm the CEO here at How Robotics. Um, 
Next slide, please, Ella. We are a robotic software company um, specializing in simplifying the programming of, of robots for all sorts of complex tasks like additive manufacturing in concretes, metals, plastics, um, highly variable tasks like welding unique bracketry for construction projects all the way through to the weird and wonderful like robots roaming around construction sites, automated car charging, throwing and catching cocktails, um, all sorts of things. And we've been doing that for the last 10 odd years. Um, and so my role this afternoon really is to is tell you why we're really interested in this in the ORP um, and how we think it might affect the the rest of, of the industrial robotics sector. Um, so next slide, please, Ella. So there's a little bit of context. Manufacturing is considerably less automated than most people are led to believe. Um, and robots are really only used for the most repetitive tasks. The reality is that very little of manufacturing is truly repeatable. Contract manufacturers and most SMEs change the parts they're producing based on client requirements. And even in things like automotive, which we envisage as kind of mass, mass production, jobs like finishing paintwork are still handled manually because the location of blemishes change on every single vehicle and therefore the robot's job effectively has to change if it were to be automated. Um, that variability is one of the major reasons that there's a bit too little, as far as I'm concerned, robotic adoption. Um, whilst you can reprogram robots between runs, it's traditionally expensive and uh, takes a lot of time, which means that you can't really run with the same efficiencies that you would if everything was fully, fully automated or fully standardized. Um, but more importantly, there are lots of cases where robots aren't deployed because the tasks they need to do require some sort of tacit knowledge, expert knowledge from an operator who probably isn't the same person who can program the robot. And so you get this kind of disconnect between the skills required to do the process and the skills of the person programming a machine to do that process. Add to those the labor and skills shortages that are ubiquitous across every industry at the moment. And hopefully, <laughs> the need for easy to use and simple to deploy automation becomes increasingly clear. So what's what needs to change? Uh, next slide, please, Ella. I imagine, uh, I haven't got that next slide yet. <laughs> Quite an important picture, there we go. <laughs> um, this is probably what most of you picture when you imagine robots in a factory. Um, almost certainly in an automotive plant, because that's who, who buys the most robots in the world for, for manufacturing. The robots in that case, ooh, sorry, uh, the robots are almost certainly dangerous, secluded, working on repetitive runs of standardized parts and assemblies. Um, and that's often the right solution. But what we're seeing now is that actually with this demand for highly flexible robots, which can be retasked easily, installed in existing workshops and working closely alongside people, this is the image that we now want to want to see and what we want to enable the deployment of. It's only with systems like this that robotics can be proliferated beyond those hyperscale industries and into other workplaces where an aging workforce and the aforementioned labor shortages are making manufacturing and other um, industrial processes increasingly difficult. But this radical shift in the deployment of this equipment changes the risk profile dramatically. It requires a new way of thinking about validation and certification of those systems. Next slide, please. So, as a manufacturer who wants to get your first robot, um, we go through kind of what the process looks like today and where we think there's there's room for improvement. So, there are many, many, and increasingly many robot webshops where you can go online. Pick the robot you need, choose a pedestal, choose a cage, choose the tool, essentially everything you need to build a robotic system. Um, you put all that in your cart, as you would on any other website going shopping, hit buy, and it all gets delivered to you, IKEA style, ready for you to assemble it yourself. Um, and you've got yourself a whole load of hardware. That's great, but it's not going to do anything just yet. So then you get a piece of software, um, something like ours or one of our competitors, but hopefully ours, obviously. Um, and you create a digital twin of your robot cell. 
which is what you'll then use to program, simulate, and generate code for your robot. That digital twin will, by necessity, contain all the components of your cell, um, cell being the kind of ensemble of robot tool, cage, equipment um, that, that's in that in that area of the robot. Um, so it'll have all that all those components in in the digital twin. It'll also contain their relationships to one another. So who's attached to whom? How far apart is part A from part B? Um, and then also what those behaviors are. So at this point in the robot's process, the tool gets activated. It gets deactivated somewhere else, or this bit starts moving. The robot stopped during this phase of the process. And that is a really important piece of information for certification and regulation going forwards. So once you've got all of that in place, you've got your hardware, you've got your software, you're really close to having installed your first robotic system. It probably hasn't been too painful. So the final step is to certify that system so that it's safe to use. And the risk and mitigation options are obviously pretty different when we go from repetitive, high volume, high speed processes in secluded areas to ones with human machine collaboration or cooperation even. But the certification process is, is pretty similar. Um, both systems have robots, which are sold as unfinished machinery and therefore need to be UK, CA or CE marked once they've been installed. And then the standard practice is you go to grab a spreadsheet template, you work your through, through a risk assessment, pulling documentation from wherever you can find it, from all sorts of different sources, and hoping that you've read every standard and covered everything. If you want to do that right, you have to be an expert in writing risk assessments, in robotics, in the process that the robot's doing, and what the operator is going to be doing, probably in the working environment, in the materials that are being worked, and probably a few more things that I can't think of right now. Um, and so if anyone has all that knowledge in your team, then great. But chances are pretty good that you don't have all of that internally. And that means calling in a specialist. And they'll have all of that knowledge or know where to require it. But if you decide to move your robot or retask it, you have to call them back in. There's a financial cost to that, of course, but it's the lack of autonomy and the time cost that makes that status quo so painful. When so much of the process and system is already digitized, we believe that we should be able to automate at least 90% of that certification for pretty standard processes if those standards are made machine readable and relevant documentation is automatically retrievable. As Alan and Zainu have already mentioned, that's the point of the ORP. Uh, next slide, please, Ella. So in practice, we think that could look very much like something like the uh, MBS Chorus specification software, which templates and guides you through the process of specifying every component in a building, but still allows the user to tweak the final output if what they're doing doesn't quite match the template. And that was actually the conclusion of the last sandbox we participated in um, with the HSE and Safety Tech Accelerator. So we're really excited to see that being pushed forwards. I'm also fully aware that robotics is a single relatively niche area of the industrial umbrella. So I'm sure there are other massive opportunity spaces out there that, uh, that people can draw from. I'm not sure who's listening today, but I think I have a couple more seconds. So if you're, considering participating in something like Sandbox, um, and so we'll describe this, the reasons why, <laughs> but, uh, I'm sure in a moment, but um, I can wholeheartedly recommend it, having been through it. Um, for us, it was a unique opportunity to work with the HSE experts and industrial end users simultaneously with a really clear common goal, uh, which wasn't immediately about the pounds and the pence. So it gave us all some space to really dig into the problems, do some root cause analysis, and propose a solution like this, rather than the fairly immediate fixes that we need to apply on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Seb, other Seb. Thanks, Seb. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Seb Corby. I'm a principal consultant at the Safety Tech Accelerator. And our role is to help uh, the HSC uh, run what we call innovation sandboxes and specifically regulatory sandboxes in this case. Um, so what is the Smart Regulation Sandbox? Um, you've probably heard of it, but I'll, I'll reiterate the kind of mission. Um, the, I guess to reiterate what Zainab and, and Helen are saying, regulatory data and information is, 
is crucial to not only construction companies obviously needing to check compliance, but it's also crucial in terms of people building digital products to help construction companies and civils companies uh, monitor compliance and, and deliver operations smoothly. And we want to make both of those things easier by digitalizing the data, uh, making it machine readable and offering it in a structured way, which is going to allow people to connect through APIs, pull the data through easily. Um, and we need to know, how, in order to do that effectively, we need to know how people are going to use that data. Um, what do they need it for? What are the notations that they need? How do they need the data be, to be structured? Um, and so we're building the digital strategy will be built off of use cases. Um, so we're looking for six use cases to run in the sandbox. Um, so the opportunity is to, to either be a provider of a digital product that you think, okay, I can, I can leverage data from the HSE and, and, and health and safety information, or you could be a construction company um, who, who needs to have a problem solved. Next, next slide, please. So we're looking for either tech companies, and um, this could be a small tech company, it could be a big enterprise provider, but we're looking for people who have really great ideas about how to leverage uh, the HSE's data into digital products. That could be a, a big piece of software that you have that you think, you know what, if we pull this data through uh, into, our, into our front end, we're gonna, we're gonna deliver a great service. Um, it could be a completely novel idea about how you want to, you could think, you know what, if we got access to that data, we could design an entirely new product that uses computer vision to automatically scan, um, scan a construction site and, and check compliance. Uh, it really is as broad as you want to make it. But we're also looking at, so we're coming from two angles, coming from the angle of a tech company and a provider. We're also coming from the angle of a problem owner. Um, so we're looking for companies, civils, construction companies who have problems to be solved within their operations, because uh, we can either we can either take the angle that we start with a great idea and we will then validate that by bringing together customers who would be construction companies, or we can start with a really good problem to be solved, and then we can look for technology companies to solve it. So we're open to uh, addressing the, the issue from both angles. Um, next slide, please. So just to give you a kind of a rough overview of what we're talking about here, you've got lots of regulators. In this case, we're talking about the HSE. Um, regulatory data is online, In information is online. Um, However, it's not machine readable, it's not easily accessible, and typically, as you heard from Seb, um, the process of checking compliance is pretty manual, actually, even though, even though the, the, the information exists digitally. So the Open Regulation Platform is a government initiative to digitize and make machine readable data uh, for, for regulations. We're looking at how we should be structuring and I guess like um, designing and maneuvering data onto that platform for the HSE so that we can deliver great use cases off the back of it. Um, so there's different ways in which a use case could be fulfilled. Um, I guess going down, <laughs> solution one, um, people might want to plug in an API. So we need, to, uh, we need to learn what data do they want access to to deliver what sort of product or piece of software, um, and it could be anything from large language models, um, you could create new applications, you might want to create a chatbot, it's, it's anything at all. Um, and the really important thing to say is that we want you to commercialize this data, it's government information, it's government data, but there's no limits to if you want to try and package this and resell it, that's what we want you to do. This is about trying to propagate, um, you know, new new ideas into the market. So it could be that you kind of want to plug into the database, and we would be working with you to work out what 
uh, firstly validating your use case because we want high impact credible ideas that can be sold and, and, and sold on um, but then also you might actually have a, a great idea that really just needs the website so the ORP is not only a database but it's also got its own front end where it's uh, interactable on the on, on the internet so we might look at actually just using the ORP's front end and working out how we should be configuring the the front end that exists to fulfill the use case um, that's also an option uh, it entirely depends on, on what ideas uh, we have through uh, next slide please Right, so just a handful of kind of ideas. Um, I can't stress enough that there's no idea that's kind of too small or too great, um, but we're looking at, you know, everything from, um, uh, uh, you know, Zainab mentioned cross-cutting cross regulation. So actually a really interesting part of this would be to um, look at how we could use the ORP to uh, configure a, a use case where people need to access not only HSC data but possibly you know another regulator's data and actually um, by designing uh, good infrastructure in the back end and, and bringing in a tech company to deliver a product we could we could help facilitate that um, is everything from you know benchmarking performance of operations checking compliance um, is that's the obvious one but also um, it's any any stage in the CDM process really the where where you feel that you interact with with um, uh, health and safety regulation data we can look at building out use cases um, next slide so um, why join um, so enhance or design digital products and services using the HSC's data assets this is a this is a real opportunity like if you if you if you are chosen to come in um you you have kind of uh, i wouldn't want to say free reign i'd probably get told off that but we want you to leverage the data we want you to commercialize it we want you to come up with really great ideas for how you could enhance your products and services and and even if it's not something that is i guess kind of even if you you don't construct ip around it at the end of the day, you would be the first person who would be ingesting the HSE's data assets into your product portfolio. Um, uh, so there's a really big opportunity there. Um, influencing the, the central government strategy for digitization, I think it's a really important one. It's a little bit more fluffy, um, but uh, both the, the HSC and, and, and central government, they want to know uh, what the industry needs in terms of structure of data, what sorts of data you'd be at, you'd be right at the table talking to those sorts of stakeholders, telling them what you need from them in terms of data um, and, and general digital transformation. Um, get promoted. We always do lots of promotion in these programs. It's about we're an accelerator. This is actually about um, making sure that organisations at the end have a better chance of selling their products and services into the market um, get a lot of really close access to both construction and industry expertise um, the way in which we do these things is we would be choosing ideas that we think not only have a really big potential to have impact but also obviously they need to um, be credible in terms of leveraging HSE's data and the ORP um, but they also need to have a big customer focus so you would be working alongside both the hse but also your potential customers because that's how we that's how we validate the ideas um okay next slide might be almost it so quick timeline um we're, we're doing what we call sourcing at the moment which is where we're we're releasing releasing the call running this webinar we're currently speaking to different people in the market about ideas that they have both customers and tech companies um, what we what we'll be doing over the next two months or so is working out which um, which ideas are going to 
for going to fulfill best in in the sandbox um so it's a bit of a kind of organic process of um we have a number of metrics that we need to hit in order for an idea to enter the sandbox so it needs to have impact it needs to be credible it needs to have customers all of those things so we'll be going through that process of evaluation uh we'll then on board we think about six ideas um could be really clear cut could be blue sky we want a real mix um could be a group of people one idea could be a single tech company um we'll then move into concept development which is where we start to flesh out the idea itself and then feasibility analysis which is we're actually saying okay we've got a good idea we know who's going to use it um we know what data it would need and then we would start to look at how you would really engineer that idea um at a kind of practical level um and you, the the kind of carrot at the end really is that if if you get to the end and you've got a really great idea then it's proven to be valuable to customers it's proven that the data is available we've worked out how we would structure it then you could potentially move into um you know some some sort of engineering um uh you know backlog after that we can't really make any promises around that at the moment because we need to see what comes in um how credible the ideas are um so that's probably it from me. I think, I'm not sure if I've got any more slides, um, but if I don't, yeah, okay, sign up. Um, uh, we need your interest by the end of this month. Um, so please, please go online, um, sign up, give us your ideas. Um, but otherwise I think we're gonna, I think uh, we'll move on to Q and A, I think. Right. Um, I think we've got I think we've got a first question. So someone's asked, would this include toolbox talks as I design graphic content, toolbox talks, and use PowerPoint as the delivery method? Um, I do know what toolbox talks are. <laughs> um, I think it. it Potentially, yes, if it's all about whether whether you need up to date um, data and information around health and safety regulations. Um, if all you're doing is kind of putting health and safety regulations on a slide, then you know maybe um, uh, you know maybe we could kind of enhance that. Maybe someone could build an app, an app that ingest the right health and safety data and you could i guess there could be an app where you plug into the um orp you you let it know what sort of toolbox talk you're doing and then it could pull down the, the right health and safety regulations um so that could be that could be an idea um but i guess i'd need to know more about what you're talking about uh okay so could you give some more working examples of what kind of tech solved what problems in the last sandbox project? Um, so the, la the last sandbox project was looking at how to counter the blockers to different types of technology on the premise that there's all of this really great, interesting technology. And at the moment, the construction company is struggling to really get it into operations. Um, the assumption was that was that there's a number of blockers some of them might be regulatory some of them might be different to that um we looked at computer vision um obviously seb and, and uh, uh robotic integration and design um we looked at uh wearables for zonal working we looked at smart noise monitoring um we looked at a kind of host of different um mostly ai technologies uh, and kind of looked at the barriers. Um, they could well be the same technologies that we'd want to look at here, should they need to ingest regulatory data. Seb, is it worth mentioning that you can find a lot more information about the previous sandbox on um, the yeah. STA website? Yeah. Yeah. So please feel free to have a look at that.
okay any more questions please um uh okay uh, right how could other regulators contribute helen do you want to take a stab at that yeah that's fine um so what we're hoping to do with this project is that we're hoping to build a blueprint that we can then share with other regulators to help them um, work in this same way in a collaborative environment with industry and tech and then also sort of utilizing the opportunity that the ORP presents um, through the SRD connection that we've got. So we are actually, we've got an advisory group for this um, project and we've got other regulators sitting on that. So we're hoping that we can engage the regulatory community and keep them up to date with things as we're progressing. And we would value regulators' input in this as we as we start developing things. So uh, we will be doing sort of regular updates from the project, and we're hoping that we can keep people briefed in that way as well. Yeah, it's a really it's a really important point that um, we should have mentioned. But there is there's a background, much more kind of strategic initiative here about um, giving the government a great way to engage with tech companies and the industry about what it needs from uh, well everything from digital regulations to um, to kind of I guess how what it how industry can actually vocalize their requirements either from a from a product point of view or a customer point of view um, uh, okay are you only looking at construction companies? at this time uh good question um heavy civils construction uh, construction with a small c um but we need to provide we need to provide some kind of scope to this but if it's that great of an idea you know um throw it in helen you i don't know if you've got anything to add to that well, I mean, really, we, we're having to keep this manageable within the timeframes of this project. But the idea is that if we can do this with HSC, we can do it with health and safety, we can do it for the construction sector, we can then expand. And that goes back to that point of that blueprint, working with other regulators. We're hoping this is just the start of it. So if you have got a really, really good idea, it's in a different sector, I would still suggest having, um, you know, a conversation with us. We can see and we can have a discussion with you. And going back to that point of, about the 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 point that was raised by, I presume it was another regulator. If you want more details, then get in touch with us and we can have a more detailed conversation with you. We're quite happy to do that. Okay, uh, we've already registered interests. How would we be invited to the next stage and when? Okay, so uh, we, the the process of evaluating which ideas will, will come into Sandbox is organic from our part. Like I said, we have a, we have a, metrics and things that we want ideas to have achieved before they enter um, that's mostly around um, demonstrating customer demand demonstrating cost and value and demonstrating a level of feasibility of the idea so that we make sure that the stuff we have in is is good and is, is hopefully going to work um, we'll be engaging on a one-to-one -one basis with the people that we're interested in um, over the next few I guess four to six weeks um so you would be we would let you know whether you had um moved to the next stage or not uh can you pl please provide more information on, on how a contract can be involved so contract can either either um come in as a clear problem owner and say we have this thing we have a system or a process or a problem in our business that we think this could really solve you could come in without a tech company and say, look, we have a problem that we want solved, help us solve it. Or you could come in with a tech company and say, we've got a problem and Seb Andras is gonna help us solve it. We wanna come into the, the, the program as a kind of, as a group. Or equally for tech companies that apply on their own, we'll be looking for construction mentors who are representative customers for them. So even if you don't have a great idea, you can flag to us that you're interested in being a mentor and we can't guarantee your role, but we'll be looking for mentors, uh, most likely. Um, uh, will the recommendations from the Sandbox be published anywhere? I'm sure they will, Helen? Yes, they most certainly will. Um, so from the previous Sandbox, um, we've 
we've published various things and you can have a look at uh, the outcomes and the recommendations from that. With this one, we'll be doing the same. We'll be publishing a report, um, probably delivering that to the Government Office for Technology Transfer, but then we'll be doing other sort of bits through social media so we'll be able to keep in touch with um, the out outputs of this project. Yeah, I mean, generally, if you do good stuff, we want to shout about it and there's a big opportunity to, to get great PR. Um, where can I find more information about the ORP? If you, you Dana. Um, thank you. Great question. We are actually on Google. It's a beta site, so it only has test data at the moment. But if you search for the open regulation platform, it should come up. There should be a blog post that gives you a bit of generic information on what we're trying to do. And then you can play around with the search and filter um, with what we call dummy data. So while the data is from regulator websites, it's been scraped off there so we can kind of see how the platform would work. So you should be able to use it at the moment. If you're trying to play around with it, it's still better to check with the relevant regulator on their website just to make sure that information hasn't been updated. Um, and as you can see from the moment, we're in a bit more of an exploratory and er experimental phase. So we hope to have more updates on the development of the site, hopefully by spring or summer. All right, um, I think I might have just dropped out there. <laughs> um, yeah, it's safe to say this part of this program is actually helping build the ORP, making sure it does what it needs to do. Um, uh, as a tech company, do we need to be focused solely on the construction sector or can our solution be available to, to the wider industries? Definitely, yes. Um, focusing on construction and heavy civils because it gives us a scope, but one of the ways in which we'll evaluate potential solutions is uh, cust customer demand and um, cost versus benefit effectively. There's a few, few rungs below that. So if you can say, well, actually not, not only are our customers in construction, but they're also in four other industries, that's a big, big bonus for you. Um, are university researchers eligible? Yes, anyone's eligible, um, but to reiterate, um, we're evaluating solutions on customer demand, value and impact and feasibility. So that means that we need to know who's going to buy it and whether they want to buy it and use it. Have we done basic cost versus benefit calculations on it? And then feasibility, you know, feasibility looks like, do we know what data is available? Do we have a service provider who would deliver the use case? Um, can we access the data in the ORP? And, and, and is, the, is the idea sound from that perspective? So um, yes, you can be a university researcher, but please hit those, please hit those things. Um, will there be financial assistance for concept development? Um, not in this sandbox. Uh, Helen, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, well, no, there's not much to add, is there? No, the, we aren't providing a financial incentive to join the sandbox this time. Uh, however, I think there's lots and lots of other benefits for joining as Seb sort of articulated. You will get chance to uh, work with experts across government, work with the um, construction sector experts and hopefully build up a, a good network. So we're hoping that that will be um, you know, a good incentive to join and come and work with us. Yeah, the best way to look at this is that um, you want to do R&D, you want to develop products um, and you can do that alongside the experts in the sandbox rather than just on your own. Um, Will this presentation be made available for reference? Yes, it will. Okay. Um, right. It looks like that might be it. Um, any other questions, please, please fire them to us now, or if you, you can, you can contact us at um, any time. We're happy to answer. Um, I can see one more Deb, that says, will we have a chance to network with others in the sandbox? Oh, um, which was, <laughs> which was, yeah, in the last sandbox, part of the great, great things about it. Um, not only networking with obviously 
Alan and and crew at the HSE, but the tech companies that were also part of the sandbox, the construction companies, and then seeing how much overlap or potential collaboration there was between between all of those very disparate ideas. Um, and meeting people who were you know, also at different stages of, the, of their business and supporting each other in that way. It was so, yes, uh, I don't know if it will be the same this time, but last time there was lots of networking and it was great. So we're intending it being the same, Seb. So, yeah, very much so. Yeah, if not more, definitely the idea of creating a community. There's so much crossover between the ideas that that come in. So, yeah, you'd be you'd be part of a community. Uh, OK, how many companies are already involved? Uh, um, there's, a, I guess there's a few different answers to this and we haven't chosen anyone 20 yet. <laughs> um, uh, however, we have a big network um, from the first sandbox. So we have a lot of established links to tech companies and clients who have good problems. And like Seb is a really great example of uh, what we found out from the first sandbox was actually that the blocker to better robotic design wasn't that the regulation itself was the limiter. It was actually smooth and automated access to regulation during the design process. And hence, we're now doing this. So um, there's a number of different tier one contractors already involved, already signed up and willing to be mentors. We don't, you know, that will that will increase. Um, we have people who own assets as well. So not just contractors, but client bodies, big, uh, either both government and private asset owners are signed up as mentors. Um, so there's already a pretty significant network, but yeah, we haven't chosen anyone yet, if that was a question. Right. Okay, that's all I've got, unless um, clearly, Clearly, I can't see quite all of them. So, uh, several so Helen, <laughs> let me know if I'm missing anything. I can't see anything else. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there. Um, any any closing points, um, Helen? Well, just to say thank you very much for joining us. We hope uh, you found that interesting, and we really hope that you will um, get involved and um, come and join us. And obviously, you can sign up there on the screen, but this you can refer back to this after this event as well. So looking forward to um, working with you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot.